Sebastian Farquhar, and I'm going to talk today about Bayesian deep learning and some issues that I think are quite interesting for trade-offs that we make when we're doing approximate inference in something like a neural network. Um, before I start, just on questions, if you have clarifying questions or there's something that I've said that doesn't quite make sense, feel free to interrupt me to ask about that. And I might tell you I'm going to address that later, or I might answer it then. Um, but more discursive questions, let's keep for the end, and we'll try to leave plenty of room to talk about those. So the, the core issue that I want to think about today is a trade-off between huge models on the one hand and principled Bayesian inference of your model parameters on the other hand. And I think this is, this is a tough question for people who are interested in Bayesian deep learning because your sort of your core neural network crowd are, you know, perhaps not obsessed with model scale, but at least have the firm belief that many problems can be resolved just by making your neural network bigger. And on the other hand, people coming at approximate inference from a more probabilistic perspective have a strong sense that as you add more parameters to your model, it becomes harder and harder to make inferences about what the distributions over those parameters ought to be given your data um, and become sort of intractable exactly. And presumably even the approximate solutions get harder and harder. Um, and what I'm going to argue today is that, that that picture isn't quite right, or rather, perhaps it is right for some specific problems we might want to solve. But for problems like approximating predictive distributions, which is a really important problem that we often want to use models for, um, it's, it's not as in, insoluble as it seems, and, and maybe there's less of a, a dilemma here than it, it feels at first glance as there is. Um, so the structure of the talk is something like this. First, I'll give a little introduction to Bayesian deep learning, why we want to do it and what it is. This will be brief. Uh, it, it won't you know, take you all the way up to being able to do Bayesian deep learning if you've never heard about it before, but hopefully should give you enough of the basic concepts to understand the rest of the talk without boring people who already know everything there is to know about Bayesian deep learning. Then I'm going to sort of lay the, the received wisdom down the idea sort of why it might be that bigger neural networks make approximate inference harder. And then I'm going to talk about one way in which it might actually make approximate inference easier. And you can think of this as being some loose combination of Sutton's bitter lesson idea plus this Bayesian deep learning concept. Um, and this is based on uh, one of my recent papers from NeurIPS. And then I'll, I'll sort of address the fact that, you know, in fact, people find it quite difficult to do approximate inference for large neural networks. Um, so if it's not, uh, if sort of my argument in point three is right, then why is it so hard? And, and in the final section, I sort of, I have a, a proposal for one thing that's making it so hard and, and how to resolve it. Um, so let's look at, at why we want to do Bayesian deep learning in the first place. So I'm going to assume that you're loosely familiar with a neural network where you take some input and then apply various operations based on weight tensors um, through various hidden layers. And finally, you get output values. And in an ordinary neural network, each of these weights is a, a real value or, or float. Um, and so the output for any given input is just a point estimate. But usually it's not the case that uh, we have no uncertainty. There are at least two sources of uncertainty. One is when you just, your training data doesn't encompass everything. And so there's some uncertainty generated by a lack of information. Um, and then also some processes just seem to be random uh, and have irreducible stochastic elements. For example, if you're trying to model something that involves rolling dice, or, or whatever else is hard to, to learn distributions, uh, to learn point values for. So what we might want to do instead, and it turns out is a very powerful tool, 
is to place a parameterized distribution over each of the weights in your network and infer those weight distributions given your data using Bayes' rule. And this is intractable for even pretty tiny networks, um, but there are a whole bunch of approximate methods that we can use in order to do this. And I'm going to focus on variational inference, which is one where uh, you um, minimize a particular divergence between your uh, true posterior distribution and your approximating distribution. But there are, there are many methods that one might use to approximate these weight distributions. Um, yes, and so here I'm just making the point that your, your outputs of normal neural networks are just points, um, where the output of your Bayesian neural network is a sample from a probability distribution over your outputs, conditioned on your inputs and your weights. And then those weights in turn, you're hoping are, are the posterior given the training data. Now, why might we want to do this? Well, there, there are many applications of Bayesian neural networks where you make use of the uncertainty. To, to be honest, it might be enough just to, to learn something with the Bayesian neural network because you get some extra regularization and generalization benefits from the fact that you're able to specify a prior. And if you can say your prior intelligently, then you can sort of inject knowledge into it that way. People don't do that much at the moment, but I think that's mostly because people don't understand how to do it very well for, for neural networks. Um, but that's sort of already a benefit of Bayesian neural networks. One thing you can do is you can use it to address continual learning problems where you are faced with one task and then you want to preserve some of the information stored in your neural network for future tasks, which is very hard with just point estimates. But if you're able to express how certain you are about each of the parameter estimates you have so far, you know a little bit about how much you can change them in light of new information on new tasks. Um, it can be useful for active learning, where you try to select points which you think are going to be most informative to train on in the future, um, where you can use the uncertainty to decide how informative things are. And you can use it for just more robust operation. When you start to insert uncertainty into pipelines of decision-making, you have less brittle systems. Um, okay, so that's like why Bayesian deep learning. And now let's think about why it might be really hard to do this approximate Bayesian inference in really big models. And here's, to my knowledge, the first time someone expressed the difficulty, which was also more or less the first time someone tried attacking uh, doing Bayesian deep learning at all, although this wasn't variational inference. This is David Mackay saying that diagonal approximation, so this is a simplifying assumption, which would say that each of your parameters are independent of each other, is no good at all because the strong posterior correlation in the parameters. Um, so he's asserting here that when you have a neural network and you're learning these parameter distributions, each distribution is correlated with other distributions. And this immediately creates problems for scale. Because when you have a diagonal approximation, a lot of things become linear in the number of parameters. Whereas the moment you start allowing correlations between them, the, um, both the memory complexity and time complexity becomes much more challenging. And here I won't go into these in detail, but um, you know, just note that the difference between this mean field variational inference where we make this diagonal approximation, which is sort of k squared where k is the the number of hidden units in a layer um, for both time and parameter complexity. If you try to model the full covariance between all of your parameters, you immediately move to totally implausible regimes. And then people have introduced very structured approximations that try not to learn the entire um, distribution uh, with all the correlations, but learn some of the important correlations. And these help a lot, but they're still slow and difficult. And it would be interesting if we could do without them. Uh, and I argue that we basically can. And in particular, the more complicated your network is, the less complicated your approximating distribution needs to be if what we care about is learning an approximating predictive distribution. So this is like, a, this is a particular perspective that I'm taking, which is to claim that what we really care about is being able to make predictions given our data 
we don't care about learning the parameter distributions for their own sake. We only care about them instrumentally as a way of getting predictive distributions. And when we adopt that mindset, then um, we can trade off between the complexity of our network and the complexity of the approximating distributions that we use, potentially getting rid of these structured correlations altogether and just using mean field distributions. So let's take Mackay's claim, and I'm just going to annotate this slightly. Um, so I'd say the diagonal approximation is actually, it's fine in deep networks. Um, I'm not saying Mackay was wrong because of course, when he was writing in 1992, he wasn't using huge neural networks. That wasn't on the table. People weren't even, you know, it, it wasn't, no one was imagining hundred layer neural networks. Um, because of the weak posterior correlations in at least one mode of the parameter distributions. And this is kind of important. Um, and I'll go into this in a little bit more detail because remember that you're free to learn whatever, um, you're, you're learning the weights. You're not just handed some existing weight means and now you need to learn distributions uh, with those means. You're able to find representations of the function in this parameterization, which suit the, the mean field approximation, particularly if you're learning that. Um, and this is going to be something that we can find empirically. And here's one, I'll just give one empirical picture and then I'll, I'll flip back to a bit of theory to sort of justify how this stuff might be working. But here, what we're looking at is we've, we've approximated the distributions over neural network parameters using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So potentially a much um, better, although more expensive approximation of the true posterior distribution over the weights. And then what we look at is the distance between a, a version of that distribution, which has an enforced mean field assumption. So it's a Gaussian mean field um, and one that allows full covariance between all of the parameters. And on two different measures of what the distance between those distributions are, we see that with only one layer, there are big differences. So that's suggesting there are strong posterior correlations. With two layers, it starts to fall a lot. And by the time you get three or more layers in your network, those posterior correlations have almost completely gone away. And you're losing almost nothing by enforcing this mean field approximation. Um, if true, that would be quite exciting because it would mean that we could set aside a whole bunch of these um, complicated, expensive structured approximations and just do the sort of the dumbest thing of assuming that all of the weights are independent of each other, which lets us scale potentially quite a lot better because now a lot of things are only linear in the number of parameters. So why might that possibly be true? Well, I think the easiest way to think about this is to get rid of the, the nonlinearities for a moment and just consider linear deep networks where depth is just a matrix multiplication. So on top, this is just a, you know, a, a, a linear regression, say, with 2D input, 2D output, and uh, four element weight matrix. And this is equivalent to splitting this out into two layers where W equals BA. And it's pretty clear, so I'm rewriting this now, doing out the multiplication explicitly, it's pretty clear that even if each element of A and each element of B are independent of each other, the elements of this product matrix aren't necessarily independent of each other. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that by adding multiple layers or by sort of by breaking up a, uh, a one layer linear model into a multi-layer linear model, even though the distributions over each of those elements might be uh, mean field, diagonal independent of all the other weights, the distribution over the product matrix sort of kind of obviously doesn't have to be mean field. Um, and in the linear case, we can sort of make some slightly more formal claims. Um, one is that you only need three layers in order to get non-zero correlations between any and all of your products matrix elements. So loosely what this means is that like three mean field layers are enough to simulate one full covariance layer. But there's like some caveats. It's a little bit hard to say exactly how expressive 
this is. It's definitely not as expressive as a full covariance matrix. And one way you can see that is just it doesn't have enough parameters. Um, but it's also clearly very expressive. So what we do also is we find like a, a limiting, a, a lower bound on how expressive um, these product matrices can be just by pointing out that a, a really constrained special case of three layers of mean field weights uh, can represent any matrix variant Gaussian, which if you remember a few slides ago was one of these structured covariance methods that people use in order to approximate the covariance in uh, Bayesian deep learning. And that's really interesting because that special case is very strong. So we, we make use of almost none of the expressivity that you get from your three mean field layers, um, but it still is as or more expressive than something that people often spend a lot of energy to do. Uh, I think a reasonable question is, okay, that's linear models, but does this have anything to do with nonlinear neural networks? Um, yes, uh, we have some like theoretical reasons why it should, and also some empirical uh, vindication of that. So one thing is if you have piecewise linear activations, like a, a ReLU or a leaky ReLU or something like that, you can divide your input space into regions within which the neural network is linear. It's sort of overall a piecewise linear function. And here's a, a visualization of what that looks like for a 2D input. This is, I think, the two moons data set. Um, and you can maybe sort of see how it's uh, adding extra detail around where the moons appear um, and not using as much of its expressive power further from the moons, which is interesting, but, but not relevant. Um, and what this does is it lets us define for each input point a sort of a local product matrix where you can get analogous results. And these local product matrices are only, you know, they only apply to a single input point, but they show how you can get similar complicated correlations at that point or in that region um, of space, even when you have these, these nonlinearities. And we can get some intuition from simulating this. So here we've trained a neural network on fashion and mist with variational inference. And we're plotting the covariance matrix of the parameters of the neural network. And when you have only one layer, um, sort of by construction, the covariance is diagonal. And as you add more layers, you start getting these interesting off diagonal patterns. And then D and E were showing this for these local product matrices for one spot in input space and you can do the same sort of thing elsewhere. So that's sort of a reason to think that maybe the analysis from the linear case extends to the, the nonlinear case. Huh. The image has not shown up here, so I won't go into this in, in all that much detail in any case, except to say that one thing that we can do um, when we add the nonlinearities in too is we can imagine that the neural network is learning the inverse CDF of some target predictive random variable. And um, this actually lets us make some claims that once you have a sufficiently big neural network for any posterior distribution you'd care to learn, there is a mean field neural network that represents that predictive distribution. And this results quite linked to another paper on a similar topic on the expressiveness of, um, I don't remember the full title, uh, but it explores this for mean field networks and also Monte Carlo dropout. Um, an excellent paper from some Cambridge folks who, who focus more on the single layer case and problems with single layer case, where we think more about, you know, the, the nice stuff that happens as you get bigger. Oh, there it is. Apparently it was, it was just waiting for an animation. Um, so we can look at this empirically again a little bit. I, I've told you already a little bit about this experiment where we used Hamiltonian Monte Carlo to get posterior samples for neural networks. And one thing that's interesting here is sort of here we're comparing these distances between the mean field and full covariance approximations to the true posterior that you get from Hamiltonian Monte Carlo um, with a variety of nonlinear activations and also linear functions. And they all show the same kind of pattern, which again is a sort of a reason to think that maybe the linear analysis 
that the sort of multiple layers are somehow able to simulate the um, predictive output of a single layer might be part of what's going on here. And then another thing we can look at, which I think is a little interesting, is like, you know, if we think that uh, these complex off diagonal correlations are really important, I mean, complicated, not, not, uh, not imaginary. Um, then you might expect that you'll like get a big performance boost by using these off diagonal correlations. Um, but that doesn't seem to be true either for variational inference or for other methods that try to use these off diagonal correlations. Regardless, it's inconsistent whether the uncertainties seem to be better or worse um, or whether there's any benefit to accuracy. Usually the diagonal methods have better accuracy and then it's sort of either way on whether the uncertainties are better. But to be honest, looking at these numbers, I mostly feel compelled to say like, there's clearly not a lot in it. So even if there are some benefits to using a uh, matrix variant Gaussian approximation, maybe there are bigger benefits to just using a larger neural network. Um, so just to recap there, what we're finding is that um, although you might think that you need to do these off diagonal uh, approximations when you're trying to do approximate inference of your posterior for a neural network, actually you can do surprisingly well with just mean field approximations as you get larger and larger networks. And there are sort of theoretical reasons to think that's going to be what happens if what you care about is the predictive distribution. Um, and we can confirm that empirically on a number of angles. But, and I think this is important, people have had a lot of trouble using mean field variational inference in big networks. And there's probably a few reasons for this, but I'm going to talk about one of them, which is a, a funky sampling problem, which comes from the fact that people usually use multivariate Gaussian distributions over the parameters in the network, just because we're used to using Gaussian distributions to be like, oh, okay, there's some theoretical nice properties of Gaussian distributions, but I think it's, there's a lot of it that's sort of habit. And when I imagine a Gaussian distribution in my head, I imagine something like this, that I define a mean in my parameter space and some sort of scale parameter. And then I've got a density where like most of the samples are coming from quite near my mean. And then the further and further I get from the mean, the fewer samples there are. And that's a very intuitive picture that comes to us from one dimensional or low dimensional spaces, but it turns out it's, it's completely wrong in high dimensional spaces. And neural networks, we're often talking about, you know, tens of millions to hundreds of millions of parameters. These are very high dimensional spaces. What does it look like instead? Well, it actually looks a bit more like this, sort of what's been referred to with the metaphor of a soap bubble, where almost all of the samples that you get from your distribution are in this narrow band, a sort of a ring or a soap bubble in the hyperspace that uh, your parameters are in. And they're at some distance away from the mean, which is fixed by both the scale parameter and also the uh, the square root of the dimensionality of your space. So again, remember, we actually have huge dimensionality here. So neural networks, often, um, all the samples are coming from really very far away from your mean. Uh, now, why is that? There's like a, one can understand in a few different ways, but this is the, the PDF um, expressed as a function of the radius, where we can see there's this one exponential term in minus r squared, and then there's another term that I've highlighted in blue, which is sort of representing the, the growth of the space as you get further away from your, your mean. And the sort of intuitively, there's like most of your um, densities are clustered near the mean, but the space expands so fast that there's this ring in between where things cancel out and most of your probability mass winds up being, um, whereas in either close to the mean or far away, one of the terms is close to zero and you have almost none of your mass. But bottom line is this is what we're actually sampling from when we do this variational inference for Bayesian neural networks usually. 
And it has a big problem, which is that unless your variance is tiny, almost none of your samples are near the mean and almost none of the samples are near each other. And what that should make us start thinking is when I like take a draw for my neural network, I take a, a realization of it and I like do a forward and backward pass to compute my gradients. Why should this have very much at all to do with what would happen if I sampled again? Um, and this should start to make us think about variance and gradient variance. And I think that's one of the key problems that people have in fact been facing. And people have been sort of, there are a lot of hacks that you can use to avoid this problem. And I think people have been using some of these hacks implicitly without maybe understanding why they're helping. Things like if you initialize your scale parameters really, really small and then use early stopping or use something like Atom, which starts to drop your learning rate relatively quickly. Or um, another thing people often do is they use a tempered posterior where they uh, reduce the influence of the prior, which tends to increase the scale parameter. And while there are some principled reasons to do that, I think one of the reasons that it's in fact successful in practice is because it allows people to finish training their model um, without the scale parameters getting to the point where you've got anything other than basically a, a point estimate going on. And so how might we fix this? Well, so, you know, th there might be better ways to fix this, but we're just keeping it really simple. We're picking a slightly different approximating distribution over our parameters. And because the problem comes from the soap bubble, which has problems, sort of properties that are easy to specify in hyperspherical coordinates, we are just going to make use of that and use hyperspherical coordinates where we set a normal distribution on the radius and a uniform distribution over the hypersphere. And this basically ends up recovering our intuition here, where it sort of it looks a lot like this left hand side image, in fact, where most of your probability mass is near the mean and then less and less as you get further and further away and that, that distance is governed by your scale parameter. And this would obviously be a pain in the ass if we needed to explicitly translate between coordinate systems, but it turns out there's a very easy way to do this. We can sample very straightforwardly from this new radial distribution just by noticing that in fact, the um, if you sort of take a multivariate Gaussian and divide it by its norm, that gives you a uniform sample over the hypersphere. Um, so in fact, all we need to add to the normal variational inference um, sampling step is normalization uh, of a tensor and multiplying by one scalar Gaussian, which is fairly cheap. If you want to make it even cheaper, you can use the fact that uh, you can predict this distance, which is also the normalization parameter to a high accuracy once D is quite big. And so you could even potentially streamline that, but to be honest, it's barely worth it. Um, and this lets you sample it efficiently. Uh, it's also quite easy to calculate, at least up to a constant, the um, KL divergence loss. And this becomes very easy to implement. Uh, and you can find more details in this repo here. I'll just pause here for a moment in case anyone wants to write it down or search for it later. Um, and was, we're currently working on a, a TensorFlow probability implementation too. So let's just run through a few examples of that potentially helping a bit. And then I'll, I'll, I'll go to questions. So we talked before about continual learning, active learning, robust operation. I'm uh, going to look first at sort of a robust operation example um, we could talk about continual learning, but I think it's probably better to go to questions. So here's an example of a robust process that we might want. Um, we'd like to be able to diagnose medical conditions automatically, ideally, so we can save uh, doctors some effort. Um, but we really don't want to misdiagnose people. At, at any rate, we definitely want to misdiagnose people less often than doctors do. Uh, but it's, it's hard. So here's an example, in the top left, we've got a healthy scan from the back of a retina. Um, and next to it, we have also a healthy scan, but which has camera artifacts, which make it a little bit hard to interpret. And on the bottom, we have two examples of diseased eyes, 
which are, you know, it's a little bit hard to tell that they're diseased. And sometimes the marks of disease look a little bit like camera artifacts. And what we would like is to have, and this is sort of what we're diagnosing here is diabetic retinopathy, which is a, a condition of the eye brought about by diabetes. And what we'd like ideally is to be able to uh, quickly identify when someone has this condition, but also to identify when our neural networks are not up to the job of um, making that decision. And then we can either request more images or pass them on to a doctor who can investigate um, with more uh, fine detail. And, and Bayesian neural networks are potentially great for this because they come with a quantification of their own uncertainty. And one thing we can do is we can use that to reject certain samples um, and say, let's send this to a doctor instead and I'm not going to, not going to classify those. And then what's interesting to look at is like, what's your classification accuracy on what remains? And here we have this and we're comparing radial BNNs to a few baselines. Um, including the sort of the previous state of the art in published literature, which was MC dropout and mean field variational inference, both like raw and then mean field inf variational inference where I went to town with tweaks and hacks like, you know, initializing learning rate really small, using early stopping aggressively, using a tempered posterior, all this sort of stuff. And what we see is the radial BNNs are able to get sort of good, strong accuracy when we're not referring anybody. So that's this 0% column. And then as you increase the percentage of people where you're saying, you know, hang on, I can't make a decision here. I have too much uncertainty. And we're measuring uncertainty here uh, using a mutual information score. Um, the accuracy goes up for, all, for almost all of the methods. Um, which is good, that's showing that the uncertainty is sort of well calibrated. And we also compare to deep ensembles, which are sort of known to be a particularly good method, um, sort of surprisingly strong baseline. Um, although we do caveat that like ensembles of models do use more parameters than just one model, generally speaking. And so when you compare to a, a radial BNN that has the same number of parameters, because it's also an ensemble of radial BNNs, that does even better. So, you know, generally I, uh, you know, it's nice to compare like with like, and in the spirit of comparing like with like, I will point out the radial BNNs do take longer to train than the, the raw ensemble model. So if you care about training time, the deep ensemble is performing very well. If you care about number of parameters and parameter efficiency, the radial ensemble is performing very well. You sort of, you take your pick. But at any rate, this trick is improving over the mean field variational inference, even when you apply all the sort of hacks. Um, and if you don't allow yourself the hacks, then mean field variational inference can perform very badly in these larger networks. Now what's going, let's, let's zoom in a little bit more on what's going on. Um, because I, I sort of alluded earlier to this being something about gradient variance, but uh, it was just sort of suggestive. So here's zooming in on a one training run for both a radial BNN and mean field variational inference. And there's this really interesting inflection point in the training that happens at about 150 epochs in when, and this isn't shown here, that's unfortunate, uh, the, the scale parameter rises above some sort of threshold where it starts to be the case that each sample from the approximate posterior distribution is like really different from the other samples. And at that point, looking at the bottom graph, we have the standard deviation of the negative log likelihood component of our loss start to go up for the um, mean field variation. Inference. And as a result, um, it becomes harder to fit to the loss and easier to fit to the, uh, the prior regularization term. And so even though both methods continue to improve the, the loss function, um, NFVI starts doing this by improving the sort of reverting to the prior while radial BNNs continue to improve both the NLL part and the prior part. And this is reflected in the accuracies. And this is sort of 
it's suggestive that what's going on is partly driven by the fact that the, the gradient variance starts to grow once you hit a certain size of the scale of your, your uncertainty, and that makes it harder to fit, which is something that you know, other people have also noticed as a problem when training these networks before and have come up with other solutions too. So in short, this sort of this is a another hypothesis for what's going on and making MFEI hard to train, which is different from the hypothesis that we need to be modeling all of these correlations, um, which recovers sort of the intuitive Gaussian behavior, fixes a gradient variance problem, and then lets you do large scale Bayesian deep learning without the sort of discrete approximations that you need for deep ensembles or Monte Carlo dropout. And to recap overall, we, we started with this kind of puzzle, which is if we want to keep making our networks bigger, um, but we also want principled approximation, is that just a hard trade-off? Um, and the reason to think it might be a hard trade-off is if we think that a good Bayesian approximation needs to involve correlations between the weights, then we're going to scale badly with the number of parameters. And then I argued that, like, in fact, once your network is big enough, if what you care about is the predictive posterior distribution, then maybe you don't need to model all of those correlations. And you can get away with just doing a, a relatively simple approximation. But then acknowledging that those simple approximations still sometimes struggle, I argued that maybe there's a different problem, which is one that's variance in your gradients which is sort of accidentally caused by the fact that we were sort of arbitrarily picking this Gaussian, this multivariate Gaussian, which turned out to have counterintuitive properties in high dimensions. But you can fix that. And when you do, things start to look a lot rosier. So I'm quite optimistic actually about getting Bayesian deep learning working in potentially very large models. Um, I think there are, uh, there's a lot of work going on in this area and I'm, I'm optimistic that people are going to figure out really good efficient ways to do it. And I think we shouldn't hold ourselves back by focusing too much on modeling the full approximate posterior distribution between these parameters, um, because that can sort of be intellectually satisfying, but might make very little difference to the quality of the approximate predictive posterior distribution. Thanks. Any questions? <laughs>